Preface to Cakes and Ale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cakes and Ale by Edward Spencer. Preface. A long time ago an estimable lady fell at the feet of an habitual publisher and prayed unto him, Give, oh, give me the subject of a book for which the world has a need, and I will write it for you. Are you an author, madam? asked the publisher, motioning his visitor to a seat. No, sir, was the proud reply. I am a poet. Ah, said the great man, I am afraid there is no immediate worldly need of a poet. If you could only write a good cookery book, now... The story goes on to relate how the poetess, not rebuffed in the least, started on the requisite culinary work. Directly she got home, pawned her jewels to purchase postage stamps, and wrote far and wide for recipes, which in course of time she obtained by the hundredweight. Other recipes she conveyed from ancient works of gastronomy, and in a year or two the magnum opus was given to the world. The lady's share in the profits giving her adequate provision for the remainder of her life. We are not told, but it is presumable that the publisher received a little adequate provision, too. History occasionally repeats itself, and the history of the present work begins in very much the same way. Whether it will finish in an equally satisfactory manner is problematical. I do not possess much of the divine afflatus myself, but there has ever lurked within me some sort of ambition to write a book, something held together by tree-calf, half-morocco, or boards, something that might find its way into the hearts and homes of an enlightened public, something which will give some of my young friends ample opportunity for criticism. In the exercise of my profession I have written leagues of descriptive copy, mostly lies and racing selections, but up to now there has been no urgent demand for a book of any sort from this pen. For years my ambition has remained ungratified. Publishers, as a rule, the most faint-hearted and least speculative of mankind, have held aloof, and whatever suggestions I might make were rejected, with determination, if not with contumely. At length came the hour and the man, the introduction to a publisher with an eye for budding and hitherto misdirected talent. "'Do you care, sir,' I inquired at the outset, to undertake the dissemination of a bulky work on political economy? "'Frankly, sir, I do not,' was the reply." Then I tried him with various subjects, social reform, the drama, bimetallism, the ethics of starting prices, the advantages of motor cars in African warfare, natural history, the martyrdom of Ananias, practical horticulture, military law, and dogs, until he took down an old duck gun from a peg over the mantelpiece and assumed a threatening attitude. Peace having been restored, the self-repetition of history recommenced. I can do with a good, bold, brilliant, lightly treated, exhaustive work on gastronomy, said the publisher. You are well acquainted with the subject, I believe. I'm a bit of a parlor cook, if that's what you mean, was my humble reply. Add a salad, a grill, an anchovy toast, or a cooling and cunningly compounded cup, I can be underwritten at ordinary rates. But I could no more cook a haunch of venison, or even boil a rabbit or make an economical Christmas pudding, then I could sail a boat in a nor'easter, and Madam Cook would certainly eject me from her kitchen with a cloud attached to the hem of my dinner jacket inside five minutes. Eventually it was decided that I should commence this book. What I want, said the publisher, is a series of essays on food, a few anecdotes of stirring adventure. You have a fine flow of imagination, I understand, and a few useful but uncommon recipes. But plenty of plums in the book, my dear sir, plenty of plums. But suppose my own supply of plums should not hold out. What am I to do? What do you do? What does the cook do when the plums for her pudding run short? Get some more. The museum, my dear sir, the great storehouse of natural literature, is free to all whose character is above the normal standard. When your memory and imagination fail, try the British Museum. You know what is a mightier factor than both sword and pen. Precisely so. And remember that in replenishing your store from the works of those who have gone before, you are only following in their footsteps. I only bar Sidney Smith and Charles Lamb. Let me have the script by Christmas. Do you smoke? Mind the step. Good morning. 
In this way, gentle reader, were the trenches dug, the saps laid for the attack of the great work. The bulk of it is original, and the adventures in which the writer has taken part are absolutely true. About some of the others I would not be so positive. Some of the recipes have previously figured in the pages of the Sporting Times, the Ladies' Pictorial, and the Man of the World, to the proprietors of which journals I hereby express my kindly thanks for permission to revive them. Many of the recipes are original. Some are my own. Others have been sent in by relatives and friends of my youth. Others have been adapted for modern requirements from works of great antiquity. Whilst others, again, I am nothing if not candid, have been conveyed from the works of more modern writers who in their turn had borrowed them from the works of their ancestors. There is nothing new under the sun, and there are but few absolute novelties which are subjected to the heat of the kitchen fire. If the style of the work be faulty, the reason, not the excuse, is that the style is innate and not modeled upon anybody else's style. The language I have endeavored to make as plain, homely, and vigorous as is the food advocated. If the criticisms on foreign cookery should offend the talented chef, I have the satisfaction of knowing that, as I have forsworn his works, he will be unable to retaliate with poison. And if the criticisms on the modern English methods of preparing food should attract the attention of the home caterer, he may possibly be induced to give his steam chest and his gas range a rest, and put the roast beef of old England on his table occasionally, though I have only the faintest hopes that he will do so. For the monster eating houses and mammoth hotels of today are for the most part run by companies and syndicates, and the company within the dining room suffer occasionally in order that dividends may be possible after payment has been made for the elaborate and wholly unnecessary furniture and decorations. Wholesome food is usually sufficient for the ordinary British appetite, without such surroundings as marble pillars, Etruscan vases, nude figures, gilding and looking-glasses, which only serve to distract attention from the banquet. It is with many a sigh that I recall the good old-fashioned inn, where the guest readily received a warm welcome. Nowadays the warmest part of that welcome is usually the bill. It is related of the wittiest man of the nineteenth century, my late friend Mr. Henry J. Byron, that upon one occasion whilst walking home with a brother dramatist after the first performance of his comedy which had failed to please the audience, Byron shed tears. How is this? inquired his friend. The failure of my play appears to affect you strangely. I was only weeping, was the reply, because I was afraid you'd set to work and write another. But there need be no tears shed on any page of this food book, for I am not going to write another. End of Preface Recording by Philip Gould Chapter One of Cakes and Ale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cakes and Ale by Edward Spencer Chapter One Breakfast The day breaks slow, but e'en must man break fast. This is a very serious subject. The first meal of the day has exercised more influence over history than many people may be aware of. It is not easy to preserve an equal mind, or to keep a stiff upper lip upon an empty stomach, and indigestible foodstuffs have probably lost more battles than sore feet and bad ammunition. It is an incontestable fact that the great Napoleon lost the battles of Baradino and Leipzig through eating too fast. When good digestion waits on appetite, great men are less liable to commit mistakes, and a mistake in a great man is a crime, than when dyspepsia has marked them for her own. And this rule applies to all men. There should be no hurry or formality about breakfast. Your punctual host and hostess may be all very well from their own point of view, but black looks and sarcastic welcomings are an abomination to the guest who may have overslept himself or herself, and who fails to say, good morning, just on the stroke of nine o'clock. Far be it from the author's wish to decry the system of family prayers, although the spectacle of the full strength of the domestic company, from the stern-featured housekeeper or the chief lady's maid, the housekeeper is frequently too grand or too much cumbered with other duties to attend public worship, to the diminutive page-boy standing all in a row, facing the cups and saucers, 
is occasionally more provocative of mirth than reverence. But too much law and order about fast-breaking is to be deplored. I'm not very punctual, I'm afraid, Sir John, I once heard a very charming lady observe to her host as she took her seat at the table, exactly ten minutes after the line of menials had filed out. On the contrary, Lady V, returned the master of the house with a cast-iron smile, you were punctual in your unpunctuality, for you have missed prayers by the sixth part of one hour, every morning since you came. Now what should be done to a host like that? In the long ago I was favoured with the acquaintance of an elderly gentleman of property, a most estimable, though eccentric, man, and he invariably breakfasted with his hat on. It did not matter if ladies were present or not. Down he would sit, opposite the ham and eggs or whatever dish it might chance to be, with a white hat, with mourning band attached, surmounting his fine head. We used to think the presence of the hat was owing to partial baldness, but as he never wore it at luncheon or dinner, that idea was abandoned. In fact, he pleaded that the hat kept his thoughts in, and as after breakfast he was closeted with his steward, or agent, or stud groom, or keeper for several hours, he doubtless let loose some of those thoughts to one or the other. At all events, we never saw him again till luncheon unless there was any hunting or shooting to be done. The same old gentleman once rehearsed his own funeral on the carriage drive outside and stage managed the solemn ceremony from his study window. An undergardener pushed a wheelbarrow containing a box of choice cuttings to represent the body, and the butler posed as chief mourner. And when anybody went wrong, or the pallbearers, six grooms, failed to keep in step, the master would throw up the window sash and roar, Begin again. But this is wandering from the subject. Let us try back. Having made wide search amongst old and musty manuscripts, I can find no record of a bill of fare of the first meal of the ancient Britons. Our blue forefathers, in all probability, but seldom assisted at any such smart function as a wedding breakfast, or even a hunting one, for the simple reason that it was a case with them of no hunt, no breakfast, unless one or the other had killed the deer, or the wild boar, or some other living thing to furnish the refection, the feast was a barmecide one, and much as we have heard of the strength and hardiness of our blue forefathers, many of them must have died of sheer starvation, for they had no weapons but clubs and rough-cut flints with which to kill the beasts of the country, who were, however, occasionally lured into pitfalls, and, as to fish, unless they tickled them, the denizens of the streams must have had an easy time of it. They had sheep, but these were valuable chiefly on account of their wool, as used to be the case in Australia ere the tin meat trade was established. Most of the fruits and vegetables which we enjoy today were introduced into Britain by the Romans. Snipe and woodcock, and, in the north, grouse, may have been bagged, as well as hares. But these poor savages knew not rabbits by sight, nor indeed much of the feathered fowl which their more favored descendants are in the habit of shooting, or otherwise destroying for food. The ancient Britons knew not bacon and eggs, nor the toothsome kipper, nor yet the marmalade of Dundee. As for bread, it was not invented in any shape or form until much later, and its primitive state was a tough paste of flour, water, and occasionally milk, something like the damper of the Australian bush, or the unleavened chupati, which the poorer classes in Hindustan put up with after baking it at the present day. The hardy and independent Saxon had a much better time of it in the way of meat and drink. But with supper forming the chief meal of the day, his breakfast was a simple though plentiful one, and consisted chiefly of venison pasty and the flesh of goats, washed down with ale or mead. A free breakfast table of Elizabeth's time, says an old authority, or even during the more recent reign of Charles the Second would contrast oddly with our modern morning meal. There were meats, hot and cold, beef and brawn and boar's head, the venison pasty and the warden pie of West Country pears. There was hot bread, too, and sundry cates, which would now be strange to our eyes. But to wash down these substantial viands there was little save ale. The most delicate lady could procure no more suitable beverage than the blood of John Barleycorn. The most fretful invalid had to be content with a mug of small beer stirred up with a sprig of rosemary. 
Wine, Hippocras, and Methaglin were potations for supper time, not for breakfast, and beer reigned supreme. None but home productions figured on the board of our ancestors. Not for them were seas traversed or tropical shores visited as for us. Yemen and Ceylon, Assam and Cathay, Cuba and Peru did not send daily tribute to their tables, and the very names of tea and coffee, of cocoa and chocolate were to them unknown. The dethronement of ale, subsequent on the introduction of these eastern products, is one of the most marked events which have severed the social life of the present day from that of the past. With the exception of the warden pie and the cates, the above bill of fare would probably satisfy the cravings of the ordinary Johnny of today, who has heard the chimes at midnight and would sooner face a charging tiger than drink tea or coffee with his first meal, which, alas, but too often consists of a hot pickle sandwich and a brandy and soda, with not quite all the soda in. But just imagine the fine lady of today with a large tankard of Burton ale facing her at the breakfast table. Tea which is said to have been introduced into China by Diarma, a native of India about A.D. 500, was not familiar in Europe until the end of the 16th century. And it was not until 1657, when Garraway opened a tea house in Exchange Alley, that Londoners began tea drinking as an experiment. In 1662, Pepys writes, Home, and there find my wife making of tea. Two years before, he called it tea, a China drink a drink which Mr. Pelling the Pothecary tells her is good for her cold and defluxions. In 1740 the price of tea ranged from seven shillings to twenty-four shillings per pound. In 1725, 370,323 pounds were drunk in England, and in 1890, 194 million eight thousand. In 1840 the duty was two shillings two and a quarter pence per pound. In 1858, one shilling five pence per pound and in 1890, four pence per pound. The seed of the coffee tree, which when roasted ground and mixed with water and unmixed with horse beans, dandelion root, or road scrapings, forms a most agreeable beverage to those who can digest it, was not known to the Greeks or Romans, but has been used in Abyssinia and along the northeast coast of Africa almost as long as those parts have been populated. Here in Merry England, where coffee was not introduced until the 18th century, it was at first used but sparingly, until it almost entirely took the place of chocolate, which was the favored beverage of the duchesses and fine madams who minced and flirted and plotted during the reign of the Merry Monarch, fifty years or so before. The march of knowledge has taught the thrifty housewife of today to roast her own coffee instead of purchasing it in that form from the retail shopkeeper, who, as a rule, under-roasts the berry in order to keep the weight in but do not blame him too freely, for he is occasionally a poor law guardian, and has to keep pace with the stores. During the Georgian era, the hard-drinking epoch, breakfast far too often consisted chiefly of French brandy, and the first meal was, in consequence, not altogether a happy or wholesome one, nor conducive to the close study of serious subjects. The history of the staff of life would require a much larger volume than this, all to itself. Footnote. It is incorrect to speak of bread as the sole staff of life. Eggs, milk, cheese, potatoes, and some other vegetables supply between them far more phosphoric acid than is to be got from bread, either white or brown. And a man could support existence on beer and baccy as well as he could do so on bread alone. In footnote. That the evolution of bread-making has been very gradual admits of no denial and as late as the Tudor and Stuart periods the art was still in its infancy. The quality of the bread consumed was a test of social standing. Thus, while the haute monde, the height of society, lords and dukes with countesses and dames of high degree, were in the habit of consuming delicate manchets, made of the finest wheaten flour of snowy purity, the middle classes had to content themselves with white loaves of inferior quality. To the journeyman and the prentice, who had to endure with patience the buffets of master and mistress, was meted out coarse but wholesome brown bread, made from an admixture of wheat and barley flour, whilst the agricultural laborer staved off starvation with loaves made from rye, occasionally mixed with red wheat or barley. The introduction of free trade, by no means an unmixed blessing, has changed all this, 
and the working classes with their wives and families can, when out of the workhouse, in the intervals between strikes, enjoy the same quality of bread, that cheap loaf which appears on the table of the wicked squire and the all-devouring parson. In Yorkshire at the present day, almost the worst thing that can be urged against a woman is that she cannot make a bit of bread. Just look, wrote an enthusiastic free trader a quarter of a century ago, at the immense change that has latterly taken place in the food of the English peasantry. Rye bread and peas pudding exchanged for wheaten loaves. A startling change, but not greatly different from what has occurred in France, where, with the abuses of the Bourbon rule, and in was put to the semi-starvation of French tillers of the soil. Black bread is now almost as much a rarity in France as on our side of the Channel, while barley in Wales, oats in Scotland, and the potato in Ireland are no longer the food staples that they were. I have no wish for anything of a contentious nature to appear in this volume, but may deliver with regard to the above the opinion that peas pudding is by no means despicable fare when associated with a boiled leg of pork and I may add that too many of the English peasantry nowadays have been reduced by this same free trade to a diet of no bread at all, in place of wheaten or any other loaves. Wedding breakfasts, with the formal speeches and cutting of the cake, have gone out of fashion, and the subject of the British breakfast of today demands a new chapter. End of chapter 1. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 2 of Cakes and Ale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cakes and Ale by Edward Spencer. Section 2. Breakfast. Continued. Sit down and feed, and welcome to our table. By far the pleasantest meal of the day at a large country house is breakfast. You will be staying there most likely, and you be a man, for hunting or shooting, it being one of the eccentric dispensations of the great goddess fashion that country houses should be guestless and often ownerless during that season of the year when nature looks at her loveliest. And you be a woman, you will be staying there for the especial benefit of your daughter, for flirting, or for the more serious purpose of riveting the fetters of the fervid youth who may have been taken captive during the London season, for romping, and probably shooting and hunting, too. For lovely women up to date takes but little account of such frivolities as Berlin woolwork, piano practice, or drives well wrapped up in a close carriage to pay calls with her hostess. As for going out with the guns, or meeting the sterner sex at luncheon in the keeper's cottage, or the specially erected pavilion, the darlings are not content nowadays unless they can use dapper little breech loaders specially made for them, and some of them are far from bad shots. Yes, tis a pleasant function, breakfast at the castle, the park, or the grange. But as observed in the last chapter, there must be no undue punctuality, no black looks at late arrivals, no sarcastic allusions to late hours, nor inane chaff from the other guests about the wine cup or the whiskey cup which may have been drained in the smoking-room during the small hours. Her ladyship looks divine, or at all events regal, as she presides at what our American cousins would call the business end of the long table, whilst our host, a healthy, jolly-looking, hard-bitten man of fifty, faces her. His bright, keen eye denotes the sportsman, and he can shoot as straight as ever whilst no fence is too high, too wide, nor too deep for him. Sprinkled about at either side of the table amongst the red and black coats or shooting jackets of varied hues, with a vacancy here and there, for Algy and Bill, and the angel who have not yet put in appearance, are smart, fresh-looking women, young and well-preserved, and matronly, some in tailor-made frocks, and some in the silks and velvets suited for those of riper age, and some in exquisitely fitting habits. It is at the breakfast table that the Englishwoman can defy all foreign competition, and you are inclined to frown or even say things under your breath when that mincing, wicked-looking little Marquisa, all frills and ribbons and lace and smiles and esbouquet in the latest creation of the first man milliner of Paris, trips into the room in slippers two sizes too small for her, and salutes the company at large in broken English. For the contrast is somewhat trying 
and you wonder why on earth some women will smother themselves with scents and cosmetics and rattle their cheeks and wear diamonds so early in the morning and you lose all sense of the undoubted fascination of the marquisa in speculating as to what manner of strong woman her femme de chambre must be who can compress a twenty-two inch waist into an eighteen inch corset there should of course be separate tea and coffee equipments for most of the guests at all events for the sluggards the massive silver urn certainly lends a tone to the breakfast table and looks comfortable like but it would be criminally cruel to satisfy the thirst of the multitude out of the same teapot or coffee pot and the sluggard will not love his hostess if she pours forth husband's tea merely because he is a sluggard and remember that the hand which is held too by honours or a straight flush the night before is occasionally too shaky to pass teacups no do not spare your servants my lord or my lady your guests must be well done or they will miss your rocketing pheasants or fail to go fast enough at that brook with the rotten banks the english said an eminent alien have only one sauce this is a scandalous libel but as it was said a long time ago it doesn't matter it would be much truer to say that the english have only one breakfast dish and its name is eggs and bacon pardon i should have written two and the second is ham and eggs a new laid egg poached not fried and you love me o oh betsy best of cooks and a rasher of home cured hog are both excellent things in their way but like a partridge a mother-in-law and a baby it is quite possible to have too much of them the english hostess i do not refer to the typical her ladyship of whom i have written above but to the average hostess certainly launches out occasionally in the direction of assorted fish kidneys sausages and chops but the staple food upon which we are asked to break our fast is undoubtedly eggs and bacon the great question of what to eat at the first meal depends greatly upon whether you sit down to it directly you emerge from your bedroom or whether you have indulged in any sort of exercise in the interim after two or three hours amateur touting on such a place as newmarket heath the sportsman is ready for any sort of food from a dish of liver and bacon to a good thick fat chop or an underdone steak i have even attacked cold stewed eels upon an occasion when the pangs of hunger would have justified my eating the tomcat and the landlady as well but chops and steaks are not to be commended to furnish forth the ordinary breakfast table i am coming to the hotel breakfast presently so will say nothing about fried fish just yet but here follows a list of a few of what may be called allowable breakfast dishes mushrooms done plainly in front of the fire sausages toasted scrambled eggs on toast curried eggs fish balls kidneys savoury omelette porridge may be useful for growing boys and briefless barristers but this chapter is not written solely in their interests above all do not oh do not forget the grill or broil this should be the feature of the breakfast such simple recipes as those for the manufacture of fish balls or omelettes or curried eggs though i shall have plenty to say about curries later on need not be given here but the following for a grill sauce will be found invaluable especially for the sluggard gubbins sauce the legs and wings of fowl turkey pheasant partridge or moorhen should only be used have these scored across with a sharp knife and divided at the joints and when your grill is taken hot as hot but not burnt from the fire have poured over it the following sauce be very particular that your cook pours it over the grill just before it is served up and it is of the most vital importance that the sauce should be made and well mixed on a plate over hot water for instance a slop basin should be filled with boiling water and a plate placed atop melt on the plate a lump of butter the size of a large walnut stir into it when melted two teaspoonfuls of made mustard then a dessert spoonful of vinegar half that quantity of tarragon vinegar and a tablespoonful of cream devonshire or english season with salt black pepper and cayenne according to the presumed tastes and requirements of the breakfasters let your sideboard it is assumed that you have a side sigh and lament its hard lot under its load of cold joints game and pies 
I am still harping on the country house, and if you have a York ham in cut, it should be flanked by a Westphalian ditto, for the blend is a good one. And remember that no York ham under twenty pounds in weight is worth cutting. You need not put it all on the board at once. A capital adjunct to the breakfast table, too, is a reindeer's tongue, which, as you see it hung up in the shops, looks more like a policeman's truncheon in active employment than anything else but when well soaked and then properly treated in the boiling, is very tasty, and will melt like marrow in the mouth. A simple excellent August breakfast can be made from a dish of freshly caught trout, the legs and back of a cold grouse which has been roasted, not baked, and a large peach. But what of the wretched bachelor as he enters his one sitting-room in his humble lodging? He may have heard the chimes at midnight in some gay and festive quarter, or like some other wretched bachelors he may have been engaged in the composition of romances for some exacting editor until the smallish hours poor outcast what sort of appetite will he have for the rusty rasher or the shop egg the smoked haddock or the billingsgate pheasant which his landlady will presently send up together with her little account for his refection well here is a much more tasty dish than any of the above and if he be square with mrs bangham that lady will possibly not object to her gal cooking the different ingredients before she starts at the wash-tub. But let not the wretched bachelor suffer the gal to mix them. I first met this dish in Calcutta during the two months of alleged cold weather which prevailed during the year. Calcutta Jumble A few fried fillets of whitefish, sole or place, sole for choice, placed on top of some boiled rice in a soup plate. Pour over them the yolks of two boiled eggs, and mix in one green chili chopped fine. Salt to taste. Another way. Mix with the rice the following ingredients. The yolks of two raw eggs, one tablespoonful anchovy sauce, one small teaspoonful curry powder, raw, a sprinkling of cayenne, a little salt, and one green chili chopped fine each ingredient to be added separately and the eggs and curry powder to be stirred into the rice with a fork. Fillets of sole to be served atop. How many cooks in this England of ours can cook rice properly? Without pausing for a reply I append the recipe which should be pasted on the wall of every kitchen. The many cookery books which I have read give elaborate directions for the performance of what is a very simple duty. Here it is in a few lines. To cook rice for curry etc. Soak a sufficiency of rice in cold water for two hours. Strain through a sieve and pop the rice into boiling water. Let it boil, gallop is, I believe, the word used in most kitchens, for not quite ten minutes, or until the rice is tender. Then strain off the water through a sieve and dash a little cold water over the rice to separate the grains. Here is another most appetizing breakfast dish for the springtime asparagus with eggs cut up two dozen or so heads of cooked asparagus into small pieces and mix in a stewpan with the well-beaten yolks of two raw eggs flavor with pepper and salt and stir freely add a piece of butter the size of a walnut one of these should be kept in every kitchen as a pattern and keep on stirring for a couple of minutes or so serve on delicately toasted bread and hotel breakfast what memories do these words conjure up of a snug coffee-room, hung with hunting prints and portraits of derby winners and churches and well-hung game with its oak panellings, easy armchairs, blazing fire, snowy naperies, and bright silver? The cheery host with well-lined paunch and fat, wheezy voice which wishes you good morning and hopes you have passed a comfortable night between the lavender-scented sheets? the fatherly interest which William, the grey-headed waiter, takes in you, stranger or habitué, and the more than fatherly interest which you take in the good cheer from homemade sassengers to new-laid eggs and heather honey, not forgetting a slice out of the mammoth York ham beneath whose weight the old sideboard absolutely grunts. Hi-ho, we, or they, have changed all that. The poet who found his warmest welcome in an inn was naturally enough writing of his own time. I don't like fault-finding, but must needs declare that the warmest part of an inn welcome to be found nowadays is the bill. As long as you pay it, or have plenty of luggage to leave behind in default, and make yourself agreeable to the fair and haughty bookkeeper, if it's a she, who allots you your bedroom, 
and bullies the page boy, nobody in the modern inn cares particularly what becomes of you. You lose your individuality and become number 325. Instead of welcome, distrust lurks, large on the very threshold. No checks accepted is frequently the first announcement to catch the eye of the incoming guest, and although you cannot help admiring the marble pillars, the oak carving, the gilding, the mirrors, and the electric light, an uncomfortable feeling comes over you at meal times, to the effect that the cost of the decorations or much of it is taken out of the food. Waiter, you ask as soon as your eyes and ears get accustomed to the incessant bustle of the coffee room and your nostrils to the savor of last night's soup, what can I have for breakfast? What would you like, sir? I should like a grilled sole to begin with. Very sorry, sir. Soles is hoff. Get you a nice chop or steak. Can't manage either so early in the day. Got any whitings? Afraid we're out of whitings, sir, but I'll see. Eventually, after suggesting sundry delicacies, all of which are either hoff or unknown to the waiter, you settle down to the consumption of two fried and shriveled shop eggs on an island of Chicago ham, floating in an Aegean sea of grease and hot water, whilst a half-quartern loaf, a cruet stand the size of a cathedral, a rack full of toast of the zebra brand, and about two gallons of alleged coffee are dumped down in succession in front of you. There are, of course, some hostelries where they do you better than this but my experience of hotel breakfast at this end of the nineteenth century has not been encouraging, either to appetite or temper, and I do vow and protest that the above picture is not too highly colored. The toothsome, necessary bloater is not often to be met with on the hotel's bill of fare, but if soft road, use no other, it will repay perusal. Toasted in a Dutch oven in front of a clear fire and just before done, split it up the back and put a piece of butter on it. The roe should be well plumped, and of the consistency of Devonshire cream. A grilled sole for breakfast is preferable to a fried one, principally because it is by no means impossible that the fried sole be second-hand, or, as the French call it, rechauffé. And why, unless directions to the contrary be given, is the modest whiting invariably placed, tail and mouth, on the frying-pan? A grilled whiting assassinate your cook if she or he scorches it, is one of the noblest works of the kitchen, and its exterior should be of a golden-brown color. Do not forget to order sausages for breakfast if you are staying at Newmarket. There is less bread in them than in the Metropolitan brand, and when in Lincoln attempt a halibut steak, of which you may not have previously heard. The halibut should, previous to grilling or frying in salad oil, be placed on a shallow dish and sprinkled with salt. Then the dish should be half filled with water, which must not cover the salt. Leave the fish to soak for an hour, then cut into slices nearly an inch thick, without removing the skin. Sprinkle some lemon juice and cayenne over the steaks before serving. If you wish to preserve an even mind and be at peace with the world, a visit to the hotel parish is not to be recommended. The Irish stew at dinner is not bad in its way, though coarse and too liberally endowed with fat. But the breakfasts, boiled oatmeal and water with salt in the mess and a chunk of stale brown bread to eat therewith, do not constitute an altogether satisfactory meal, the first thing in the morning. And it is hardly calculated to inspire him with much pride in his work, when the guest is placed subsequently before his task of unbroken flints or tarred rope. End of section 2. Recording by Philip Gould. Section three of Cakes and Ale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cakes and Ale by Edward Spencer. Section three. Breakfast. Continued. There's nought in the highlands but sibes and leeks, and lang legged callants gone wanting the breeks. For a warm welcome, commend me to Bonnie Scotland. Say for learnin' that they are our difficult to convince ye kin. These rugged Caledonians be tender of heart, and philanthropic to a degree. Heck, stirs, but tis the braw time ye'll hay. Gin ye trapes the highlands and the lowlands as well, for the matter of that, in search a good refreshment for body and soul. 
Even that surly lexicographer, Dr. Samuel Johnson, who, by the way, claimed the same city for his birthplace as does the writer, who could not be induced to recognize the merits of Scotch scenery, and preferred Fleet Street to the Trossachs, extolled the luxury of a Scotch breakfast above that of all other countries. And Sir Walter Scott, who never enthused much about meat and drink, is responsible in Waverley for a passage calculated to make the mouths of most people water. He found Miss Bradwardine presiding over the tea and coffee, the table loaded with warm bread, both of flour, oatmeal, and barley meal, in the shape of loaves, cakes, biscuits, and other varieties, together with eggs, reindeer ham, mutton and beef ditto, smoked salmon, and many other delicacies. A mess of oatmeal porridge, flanked by a silver jug which held an equal mixture of cream and buttermilk, was placed for the barren share of the repast. And, as Mr. Samuel Weller would have observed, a wary good idea of a breakfast, too. A beef ham sounds like a large order for breakfast, even when we come to consider that the Scotch beastie in Sir Walter Scott's time was wanting in beam and stature. I have seen and partaken of a ham cut from a Yorkshire pig, and weighing fifty-two pounds. But even a Scotch beef ham must have topped that weight considerably. Fortunately, the sideboards of those times were substantial of build. Missing from the above bill of fare is the haddock. The Finian haddy, a bird which at that period had probably not been invented. But the modern Scottish breakfast table is not properly furnished without it. The genuine Finian is known by its appetizing savor, and by its color, a creamy yellow which is totally distinct from the Van Dyke brownie hue of the haddock, which is creosoted in the neighborhood of the Blackfriars Road, London, S.E. Strip off the skin, says the recipe in one cookery book, or over a quick clear one. Another way, my way, is not to strip off the skin and to steam your haddies. Place them in a dish which has been previously heated. Throw boiling water on them and cover closely with a plate. Place on a hot stove and in from ten to fifteen minutes the finians will be accomplished. Drain and serve hot as hot, buttered with a sprinkling of cayenne and maybe a dash of Worcestershire sauce. Salmon is naturally a welcome guest at the table of the land of his birth, served fresh when in season, and smoked or kippered at all times. A salmon steak with the curd between the flakes, placed within a coat of virgin white paper, oiled, and grilled for fifteen minutes or so, is an excellent breakfast dish. A fry of small troutlets, a ditto of the deer's interior economy, mim. When up at the death of a hunted stag, always beg or annex a portion of his liver, are also common dishes at the first meal served by the good wife and I once met a cold haggis at 9.30 a.m. But this, I rather fancy, was a wee bit joke at my expense. Anyhow, I shall have plenty to say about the great chieftain of the pudding race in a later chapter. Off to Goldland. Those that go down to the sea in ships and can summon up sufficient presence of mind to go down to the saloon at meal times have far from a bad time of it. Living was certainly better on the ocean wave in the days when livestock was kept on board and slaughtered as required, for the effect of keeping beef, pork, and mutton in a refrigerating chamber for any length of time is to destroy the flavor and to render beef indistinguishable from the flesh of the hog, and mutton as tasteless as infantine pap. But the ship's galley does its little utmost, and the saloon passenger on his way to the other side of the equator may regale himself with such a breakfast as the following which is taken from the steward's book of a vessel belonging to the Union Line. Porridge, fillets of haddock with fine herbs, mutton chops and chipped potatoes, savory omelet, bacon on toast, minced collops, curry and rice, fruit, rolls, toast, etc., tea and coffee. Cannot my readers imagine a steward entering the stateroom of the voyager who has succumbed to the wiles and eccentricities of the Bay of Biscay, with the observation, won't you get up to breakfast, sir? I've reserved a beautiful fat chop with chips a purpose for you, sir. And the lot of the third-class passenger who is conveyed from his native land to the Cape of Good Hope, for what Mr. Montague Tigg would have called the ridiculous sum of sixteen pounds sixteen shillings, is no such hard one, seeing that he is allotted a bunk in a compact though comfortable cabin, 
and may break his fast on the following substantial meal. Porridge, Yarmouth bloaters, potatoes, American hash, grilled mutton, bread and butter, tea or coffee. An American breakfast is as variegated, and I fear I must add as indigestible, as a Scottish one, and included in the bill of fare are as many or more varieties of bread and cake as are to be found in the land of shortbread. The writer has, in New York, started the morning meal with oysters, run the gamut of fish, flesh, and fowl, and wound up with buckwheat cakes, which are brought on in relays, buttered and smoking hot, and can be eaten with or without golden syrup. But as business begins early in New York and other large cities, scant attention is paid to the first meal by the merchant and the speculator, who are wont to gallop through breakfast and luncheon and to put in their best work at dinner. A Mediterranean breakfast is not lacking in poetry, and the jaded denizen of Malta can enjoy red mullet, the woodcock of the sea, freshly taken from the tideless ocean and strawberries in perfection at his first meal, whilst seated maybe next to some dreamy-eyed hoary who coos soft nothing into his ear at intervals. The wines of Italy go best with this sort of repast, which is generally eaten with spoons. In fair France, breakfast, or the déjeuner à la fourche, is not served until noon or thereabouts. Coffee or chocolate with fancy bread and butter is on hand as soon as you wake, and I have heard that for the roisterer and the petite cuvée there be such liquors as cognac, curacao, and chartreuse verte, provided at the first meal so that nerves can be strung together and headaches alleviated before the associated breakfast at midday. In the country at the chateau of Monsieur et Madame, the groom of the chambers, or maitre d'hôtel, as he is designated, knocks at your bedroom door at about eight-thirty. Who's there? Good morning, monsieur. Will monsieur partake of the chocolate, or of the café au lait, or of the tea? Upon ordinary occasions, monsieur will partake of the chocolat, if he be a French extraction, while the English visitor will partake of the café au lait, tea-making in France being still in its infancy. And if monsieur has gauged too long on the wine of the country overnight, he will occasionally, reprobate that he is, partake instead of the vieux cognac, diluted from the siphon, and monsieur never sees his host or hostess till the assembly sounds for the midday meal. I have alluded just above to French tea-making. There was a time when tea, with our lively neighbors, was as scarce a commodity as snakes in Iceland, or rum punch in Holloway Castle. Then the thin end of the wedge was introduced, and the English visitor was invited to partake of a cup of what was called, by courtesy, they, which had been concocted expressly for her or him. And tea, à la Francais, used to be made somewhat after this fashion. The cup was half filled with milk, sugar, a discretion, being added. A little silver sieve was next placed over the cup, and from a jug sufficient hot water, in which had been previously left to soak some half-dozen leaf fragments of green tea, to fill the cup, was poured forth. In fact, the visitor was invited to drink a very nasty compound indeed, something like the wish tea with which the schoolmistress used to regale her victims, milk and water, and wish you may get tea. But they have changed all that across the channel, and five o'clock tea is one of the most fashionable functions of the day, with the beau monde. A favorite invitation of the society belle of the fin de siècle, being, voulez-vous five o'clock air avec moi? The déjeuner usually begins with a consommé, a thin, clear soup, not quite adapted to stave off the pangs of hunger by itself, but grateful enough by way of a commencement. Then follows an array of dishes containing fish and fowl of sorts, with the inevitable cotelettes a la somebody or other, not forgetting an omelette, a mess which the French cook alone knows how to concoct to perfection. The meal is usually washed down with some sort of claret, and a subsequent café with the accustomed chasse, while the welcome cigarette is not defended even in the mansions of the great. There is more than one way of making coffee that of the lodging-house general and of the street-stall dispenser during the small hours, being amongst the least commendable. Without posing as an infallible manufacturer of the refreshing, though indigestible to many people, beverage, I would urge that it be made from freshly roasted seed, ground just before wanted. Then heat the ground coffee in the oven and place upon the perforated bottom of the upper compartment of a cafetiere, put the strainer on it, and pour in boiling water, gradually. 
the duke in genevieve de brabant used to warble as part of a song in praise of tea and tis also most important that you should not spare the tea so it is of equal importance that you should not spare the coffee there are more elaborate ways of making coffee but none that the writer has tried are in front of the old cafetiere if the simple directions given above be carried out in their entirety as in france sojourners for their sins in the burning plains of ind have their first breakfast or chota hazri at an early hour whilst the breakfast proper usually described in lower bengal madras and bombay as tiffin comes later on for chota hazri literally little breakfast which is served either at the mess house the public bath or in one's own bungalow beneath the veranda poached eggs on toast are de rigueur whilst i have met such additions as unda ish campbell scrambled eggs potato cake and naughty naughty anchovy toast tea or coffee are always drunk with this meal always have i written alas in my mind's eye i can see the poor indian vainly trying to stop the too free flow of the baladi pani literally europe water by thrusting a dusky thumb into the neck of the just opened bottle and in my mind's ear can i catch the blasphemous observation of the subaltern as he remarks to his slave that he does not require in his morning's livener the additional flavor of mohammedan flesh and the hubble bubble pipe the tobacco in which may have been stirred by the same thumb that morning coffee shop is a favorite function during the march of a regiment in india at least it used to be in the olden time before troops were conveyed by railway dooleys roughly made palanquins laden with meat and drink were sent on halfway overnight and grateful indeed was the cup of tea or coffee or the peg which was poured forth for the weary warrior who had been tramping it or in the saddle since two a m or some such unearthly hour in order that the column might reach the new camping ground before the sun was high in the heavens it was at coffee shop that chaff reigned supreme and speculations as to what the shooting would be like at the next place were indulged in and when that shooting was likely to take the form of long men armed with long guns and long knives the viands which consisted for the most part of toast biscuits poached eggs and undabakum eggs and bacon were devoured with appetites all the keener for the prospect in view it is in troublous times be it further observed that the hindustan keet is seen at his best on the field of battle itself i have known coffee and boiled eggs or even a grilled fowl produced by the fearless and devoted nakur from apparently nowhere at all at the indian breakfast proper all sorts of viands are consumed from the curried prawns and europe provisions which arrive in an hermetically sealed condition per s s namawa to the rooster who heralds your arrival at the dak bungalow with much crowing and who within half an hour of your advent has been successfully chased into a corner beheaded plucked and served up for your refection in a scorched state i have breakfasted off such assorted food as curried locusts boiled leg of mutt fried snipe europe sausages iron ishtu iris stew vila leaf veal olives and more correctly a dinner dish kidney toast chopped sheep's kidneys highly seasoned with pepper lime juice and worcestershire sauce very appetizing parrot pie eggs and bacon omelette which might also have been used to patch ammunition boots with sardines fried fish mind the bones of the asiatic fish Bifish steak, beef steak, goat chops, curries of all sorts, hashed venison and roast peafowl, ditto quail, ditto pretty nearly everything that flies, cold buffalo hump, grilled sheep's tail, a bit bilious, hermetically sealed herring, turtle fins, guava jelly, preserved mango, homemade cake, and many other things which have escaped memory. I am coming to the curry part of the entertainment later on in the volume but may remark that it is preferable when eaten in the middle of the day my own experience was that few people touched curry when served in its normal place at dinner as a course of itself just before the sweets breakfast with my tutor what happy memories of boyhood do not the words conjure up of the usually stern unbending preceptor pouring out the coffee and helping the sausages and mashed potatoes 
we always had what is now known as sauce and mash at my tutor's and the fatherly air with which he would remind the juvenile glutton who had seated himself just opposite the apricot jam and was improving the occasion that eleven o'clock school would be in full swing in half an hour and that the brain and by process of reasoning the stomach could not be in too good working order for the fervid young student of herodotus the ordinary breakfast of the lower boy at eton used to be of a very uncertain pattern indeed what with fagging the preparation of his lord and master's breakfast the preparation of pupil room work and agile and acute scouts ever on the alert to pilfer his roll and pat of butter that boy was lucky if he got any breakfast at all if he possessed capital or credit he might certainly stave off starvation at brown's with buttered buns and pickled salmon or at weber's or the wall with three-cornered jam tarts or a strawberry mess but Smith Minor and Jones Minimus, as often as not, went breakfastless to second school. At the university, breakfast with the head or any other dawn was a rather solemn function. The table well and plentifully laid, and the host hospitality itself, but occasionally, nay, frequently occupied with other thoughts. A departed friend used to tell a story of a breakfast of this description. He was shaken warmly by the hand by his host, who afterwards lapsed into silence my friend to force the running ventured on the observation it's a remarkably fine morning sir is it not no reply came in fact the great man's thoughts were so preoccupied with greek roots and other defunct horrors that he spoke not a word during breakfast but when an hour or so afterwards the time came for his guest to take leave the head shook him by the hand warmly once more and remarked abstractedly do you know mr johnson I don't think that was a particularly original remark of yours. End of section three. Recording by Philip Gould. Section four of Cakes and Ale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corinne LePage Cakes and Ale by Edward Spencer Chapter 4 Luncheon Tis a custom more honoured in the breach than the observance. More honoured in the breach, do you say, Mr. Author? I fancy I hear some reader inquire. Are these your sentiments? Do you really mean them? Well, perhaps they ought to be qualified unless a man breakfast very early and dine very late he cannot do himself much good by eating a square meal at one thirty or two p m there can be no question but that whilst thousands of the lieges despite soup kitchens workhouses and jails perish of absolute starvation as many of their more fortunate brethren perish in the course of time from gluttony from falling down sometimes literally and worshipping the belly god Years ago, Sir Henry Thompson observed to a friend of the writers, Most men who seek my advice are suffering under one of two great evils, eating too much good food or drinking too much bad liquor, and occasionally they suffer under both evils. This luncheon, writes Oliver Wendell Holmes, is a very convenient affair. It does not require any special dress. It is informal and can be light or heavy as one chooses. The American, the male American at all events, takes far more count of luncheon than of breakfast. But in many cases, luncheon and early dinner are synonymous terms. Take the family luncheon, for instance, of the middle classes, where mother, governess, and the little ones all assemble in front of the roast and boiled at the principal meal of the day, and the more or less snowy tablecloth is duly anointed with gravy by poor baby in her high chair and the youngest but one is slapped at intervals by his instructress for using his knife for the peas at the risk of enlarging his mouth or for swallowing the stones of the cherries which have been dealt him or her from the tart this is not the sort of meal for the male friend of the family to drop in at if he value the lapels of his new frock coat and be given to blushing for children have not only an evil habit of pawing the visitor with jammy fingers but occasionally narrate somewhat risky anecdotes 
and a child's ideas of the christian religion nay of the creator himself are occasionally more quaint than reverent ma dear once lisped a sweet little thing of six what doth god have for hith dinner shish sh, sh, my child replied the horrified mother you must not ask such dreadful questions god does not want any dinner remember that oh continued the unabashed and dissatisfied enfant terrible and after a pause then i suppose he hath an egg with his tea in a country house of course but few of the male guests turn up at the domestic luncheon being otherwise engaged in killing something or in trying to kill something or in that sport which is partially understood out of great britain the pursuit of an evil savoured animal who is practically worthless to civilization after his capture and death it is in the city that vile man perhaps puts in his best work as an easter of luncheons some city men there be of course poor wretched half-starved clerks whose state nobody ever seems to attempt to ameliorate whose midday refections are not as would have earned a meed of commendation from the late vitellius or from the late colonel north for said refections but seldom consist of more important items than a thick slice of bread and a stable bloater or possibly a home-made sandwich of bread and dutch cheese the whole washed down with a tumbler of milk or more often a tumbler of the fluid supplied by the new river company during the winter months a pennyworth of roasted chestnuts supplies a filling though indigestible meal to many a man whose employer is swilling turtle at birch's or at the big house in leadenhall street and who is compelled by the exigencies of custom to wear a decent black coat and some sort of tall hat when on his way to and from business but the more fortunate citizens how do they do themselves at luncheon for some there is the cheap soup house or the chop and steak house reviled of dickens and but little changed since the time of the great novelist then for the gilt-edged division there is birches the little green house which although now run by those eminent caterers misters ring and brimer is still known by the name of the old alderman who deserved so well of his fellow citizens and who whilst a cordon bleu of some celebrity had also a pretty taste as a playwright the old house has not changed one jot either in appearance customs or fare at the little counter on the ground floor may be obtained the same cheesecakes tartlets baked custards and calf's foot jellies which delighted our grandfathers and the same brand of scottish whisky upstairs in the soup rooms some of the tables are covered with damask tablecloths whilst at others a small square of napery but partially obscures the view of the well-polished mahogany turtle soup is still served on silver plates whilst the cheaper juices of the bullock the calf and the pea with the usual trimmings repose temporarily on china or earthenware pates whether of oyster lobster chicken or veal and ham are still in favour with habitués and chance customer alike and no wonder for these are something like pates the filling is kept hot like soups in huge stew pans on the range and when required is ladled out into a plate and furnished with top and bottom crust and such crust flaky and light to a degree and how different to the confectioner's or railway refreshment pate which when an orifice be made in the covering with a pickaxe reveals nothing more appetizing than what appear to be four small cubes of frost-bitten india-rubber with a portion or two of candle-end a more advanced meal is served in leadenhall street at the ship and turtle said to be the oldest tavern in london and which has been more than once swept and garnished and reformed altogether since its establishment during the reign of king richard the second but they could have known but little about the superior advantages offered by the turtle as a life-sustainer in those days whereas at the present day some hundreds of the succulent reptiles die the death on the premises within a month in order that city companies and stockbrokers and merchants of sorts and mining millionaires and bicycle makers and other esteemable people may dine and lunch then there are the numerous clubs 
not forgetting one almost at the very door of the house where the two thousand odd and some of them very odd members are regaled on the fat of the land in general and the turtle in particular day by day in that mammoth underground palace the palmerston where any kind of banquet can be served up at a few minutes notice and where special greek dishes are provided for the gamblers in wheat and other cereals at the adjacent baltic there be also other eating-houses far too numerous to mention but most of them worth a visit a filling sort of luncheon is a portion of a cheshire cheese pudding a little way up a gloomy court on the north side of fleet street a neighbourhood which reeks of printer's ink bookmakers runners tipsters habitual borrowers of small pieces of silver and that warm smell of burning paste and molten lead which indicates the foundry in a printing works is situated this ancient holstery it is claimed for the cheese that it was the tavern most frequented by dr samuel johnson mr c redding in his fifty years recollections literary and personal published in eighteen fifty eight says i often dined at the cheshire cheese johnson and his friends i was informed used to do the same and i was told i should see individuals who had met them there this i found to be correct the company was more select in later times but there are fleet street tradesmen who well remembered both johnson and goldsmith in this place of entertainment few americans who visit our metropolis go away without making a pilgrimage to this ancient holstery where upstairs dr johnson's chair is on view and many visitors carry away mementos of the house in the shape of pewter measures the oaken platters upon which these are placed and even samples of the long churchwarden pipes smoked by habitues after their evening chops or steaks ye pudding which is served on wednesdays and saturdays at one thirty or six is a formidable-looking object, and its savour reaches even into the uttermost parts of Great Grub Street. As large, more or less, as the dome of St. Paul's, that pudding is stuffed with steak, kidney, oysters, mushrooms, and larks. The irreverent call these last-named sparrows, but we know better. This pudding takes, on D, seventeen and a half hours in the boiling, and the bottom crust would have delighted the hearts of Johnson, Boswell, and company, in whose days the savoury dish was not. The writer once witnessed a catastrophe at the Cheshire cheese, compared to which the burning of Moscow or the bombardment of Alexandria were mere trifles. One thirty on Saturday afternoon had arrived, and the oaken benches in the refectory were filled to repletion with expectant pudding-eaters. Burgesses of the City of London were there, good warm round-bellied men with ploughboys appetites and journalists and advertising agents and resting actors and magistrates clerks and baristers from the temple and well-to-do tradesmen sherry and gin and bitters and other adventitious aids to appetite had been done justice to and the arrival of the procession it takes three men and a boy to carry the pièce de résistance from the kitchen to the dining-room was anxiously awaited and then of a sudden we heard a large crash followed by a feminine shriek and an unwhispered saxon oath tom the waiter had slipped released his hold and the pudding had fallen downstairs it was a sight ever to be remembered steak larks oysters delicious gravy running in a torrent into wine office court the expectant diners many of them lunchers stood up and gazed upon the wreck of their hopes and then filed silently and sadly outside such a catastrophe had not been known in brainland since the great fire puddings of all sort are in fact favourite autumn and winter luncheon dishes in london and the man who can come twice at such a dream as the following between the hours of one and three can hardly be in devouring trim for his evening meal till very late it is a snipe pudding a thin slice of beef skirt seasoned with pepper and salt at the bottom of the basin then three snipes beheaded and befooted and with gizzards extracted 
leave the liver and heart in and you value your life cover up with paste and boil or steam for two and a half hours for stockbrokers and bookmakers mushroom and truffles are sometimes placed within this pudding but it is better without according to the writer's notion most of the fowls of the air may be treated in the same way and when eating cold grouse for luncheon try if you can get it a fruit salad therewith you will find preserved peaches apricots and cherries in syrup harmonize well with cold brown game lancashire hot pot is a savoury dish indeed but i know of but one eating house in london where you can get anything like it here is the recipe place a layer of mutton cutlets with most of the fat and tails trimmed off at the bottom of a deep earthenware stewpan then a layer of chopped sheep's kidneys an onion cut into thin slices half a dozen oysters and some sliced potatoes sprinkle over these a little salt and pepper and a teaspoonful of curry powder then start again with cutlets and keep on adding layers of the different ingredients until the dish be full whole potatoes atop of all and pour in the oyster liquor and some good gravy more gravy just before the dish is ready to serve not too fierce an oven just fierce enough to brown the top potatoes in making this succulent concoction you can add to or substitute for the mutton cutlets pretty nearly any sort of flesh or fowl i have met rabbit goose larks turkey and frequently beef therein but believe me the simple harmless necessary toothsome cutlet makes the best lining in the cape colony and even as high up as rhodesia i have met with a dish called a brady which is worthy of mention here it is made in the same way as the familiar irish stew but instead of potatoes tomatoes are used end of section four recording by corinne lepage Section five of Cakes and Ale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corinne LePage. Cakes and Ale by Edward Spencer. Section five. Luncheon. Continued. He couldn't hit a haystack. There is no meal which has become more expanded than a shooting luncheon a crust of bread with cheese or a few biscuits and a flask of sherry sufficed for our forebears who despite inferior weapons and ammunition managed to bring em down quite as effectually as do the shootists of this period most certainly and decidedly a heavy luncheon is a mistake if you want to shoot clean afterwards and bear this in mind all ye johnnies who rail at your host's champagne and turtle after luncheon in a comfortable pavilion in the midst of a pheasant battue and whose very beaters would turn up their noses at a pork pie and a glass of old ale that there is nothing so good to shoot up upon as cold tea unless it be cold coffee i have tried both and for a shooting luncheon par excellence commend me to a crust and a pint of cold tea eaten whilst sitting beneath the shelter of an unpleached hedge against the formal spread which commences with a consommé and finishes with guinea peaches and liquors of rare curaçao of course it is assumed that the shooter wishes to make a bag but as fortunately for trade everybody does not share my views it will be as well to append a few dishes suitable to a scratch meal of this sort first of all let it be said that a roast loin of pork washed down with sweet champagne is not altogether to be commended i have nothing to urge against roast pork on ordinary occasions or champagne either but a woodcock takes a lot of hitting such a pudding as was sketched in the preceding chapter is allowable as is also the lancashire hot pot shepherd's pie i e minced meat beneath the mattress of mashed potatoes with lots of gravy in the dish baked is an economical dish but a tasty one and i have never known much left for the beaters rabbit pie or pudding will stop a gap most effectually and plover pudding the very name brings water to the lips 
is entitled to the highest commendation. This is the favorite dish at the shooting luncheons of a well-known royal duke, and when upon one occasion the discovery was made that, through some misunderstanding, said pudding had been devoured to the very bones by the loaders, while well, the band played, as they say out west, and a stirring tune did that band play too. Such larks! Stuff a dozen larks with a force meat made from their own livers chopped, a little shallot, parsley, yolk of egg, salt, bread crumbs, and one green chili chopped and divided amongst the twelve. Brown in a stew pan, and then stew gently in a good gravy to which has been added a glass of burgundy. This is a plat fit for an emperor, and there will be no subsequent danger of his hitting a beater or a dog. Another dainty of home invention is jugged duck with oysters cut the fleshy parts of your waddler into neat joints and having browned them place in a jar with nine oysters and some good gravy partly made from the giblets close the mouth of the jar and stand it in boiling water for rather more than an hour add the strained liquor of the oysters and a little more gravy and turn the concoction into a deep silver dish with a spirit lamp beneath wild duck can be jugged in the same way but without the addition of the bivalves, and a mixture of port wine, and Worcester sauce should be poured in with a squeeze of lemon juice and cayenne just before serving. Another dish which will be found grateful and comforting is an old grouse. The older, the tastier. Stuff him with a Spanish onion, add a little gravy and seasoning, and stew him till the flesh leaves the bones. All these stews, or jugs, should be served on dishes kept hot by lighted spirit beneath them, this is most important. A woodcock pie will be found extremely palatable at any shooting luncheon, although more frequently to be met on the sideboards of the great and wealthy. In fact, at Christmas time, tis a pie which is specially concocted with the royal kitchen at Windsor Castle to adorn Her Most Gracious Majesty's board at Osborne, together with the time honored baron of specially fed beef. This last name joint hardly meets my views as part of a breakfast menu, but here's the recipe for the woodcock pie. Bone four woodcocks. I don't mean take them off the hooks when the gentleman is not in his shop, but tell your cook to take the bones out of one you've shot yourself. Put bones and trimmings into a saucepan with one shallot, one small onion, and a sprig of thyme. Cover them with some good stock and let this gravy simmer a while. Take the gizzards away from the heart and liver, pound, and mix these with some good veal force meat. Place the woodcocks, skin downward, on a board, spread over each two layers of force meat, with a layer of sliced truffles in between the two. Make your crust either in a mold or with the hands. Put a layer of force meat at the bottom, then two woodcocks, then a layer of truffles, then the other two woodcocks, another layer of truffles, and a top layer of force meat and some thin slices of fat bacon. Cover the pie, leaving a hole for the gravy, and bake in moderate oven. After taking out, pour in the gravy, then close the orifice and let the pie get cold before serving. It will stimulate the digging industry if one or two whole truffles have been hidden away in the recesses of the pie. Another good pie I have met with in the north country was lined with portions of grouse and black game, no bones with here and there half a hard-boiled egg nothing else except the necessary seasoning with regard to hunting luncheons it cannot be said that your nimrod is nearly as well catered for as is the gun for as a rule the first named if he be really keen on the sport of kings has to content himself during the interval of a check with the contents of a sandwich case and a flask which may contain either brown sherry or brandy and water or possibly something still more seductive. I have heard of flasks which held milk punch, but the experience is by no means a familiar one. If your nimrod be given to macadamizing instead of riding the line, or if he sicken of the business altogether before hounds throw off, he can usually cadge a lunch at some house in the neighborhood, even though it may only run to bread and cheese, or possibly a wedge of a homemade pork pie with a glass or mug of nut-brown ale. Not that all ale is nut-brown, but tis an epithet which likes me as well. Would it were possible to give practical hints here as to the true way to manufacture a pork pie? To make the attempt would, I fear, only serve to invite disaster, for the art of pork pie-making 
like that of the poet or the play-actor should be born within us in large households in midland counties wherein doth flourish the pig tart there is as a rule one qualified pie-maker who is incapable of any other culinary feat whatever i have even been told that it requires special hands to make the crust of the proper consistency and having tasted crusts and crusts i can implicitly believe this statement here is a recipe for a veritable savoury yorkshire pie bone a goose and a large fowl fill the latter with the following stuffing minced ham veal suet onion sweet herbs lemon peel mixed spices goose liver cayenne and salt worked into a paste with the yolks of two eggs sew up the fowl truss it and stew it with the goose for twenty minutes in some good beef and giblet stock with a small glass of sherry in a close stewpan then put the fowl inside the goose and place the goose within a pie mould which has been lined with good hot water paste let the goose rest on a cushion of stuffing and in the middle of the liquor in which he has been stewed surround him in the pie with slices of parboiled tongue and chunks of semi-cooked pheasant partridge and hare filling in the vacancies with more stuffing put a layer of butter on top roof in the pie with paste bake for three hours and eat either hot or cold the latter for choice for skating luncheon irish stew is the recognized entree served in soup plates and washed down with hot spiced ale in way of race-course luncheons our caterers have made giant strides in the last dozen years a member of a large firm once told me that it was out of the question to supply joints chops and steaks in the dining rooms of a grand stand distant far from his base of operations london impossible my dear sir we couldn't do it without incurring a ruinous loss but the whirligig of time has proved this feat to be not only possible but one which has led to the best results for all concerned in the matter of chops and steaks i hope to see further reforms introduced these succulent dainties it cannot be too widely known are not at their best unless cut fresh from loin or rump just before being placed on the gridiron the longer a cut chop raw is kept the more of its virtue is lost it might possibly cause a little extra delay and a little extra expense to send off loins and rumps from the butcher's shop instead of ready-cut portions but the experiment would answer in the long run the same rule of course should apply to restaurants and grill rooms all over the world during the autumn and winter months race-course caterers seem to have but one idea of warm comforting food for their customers and the name of that idea is irish stew this is no doubt an appetizing dish but may be varied occasionally for the benefit of the habitual follower of the sport of kings why not pea soup jugged hare hares are cheap enough hot pot scotch broth mulligatawny hotchpotch stewed or curried rabbit with rice shepherd's pie hare caught oxtails sheep's head broth scotch fashion and hare soup what is the matter with the world-renowned stew of which we read in the old curiosity shop the supper provided by the landlord of the jolly sand boys for the itinerant showmen here it is again it's a stew of tripe said the landlord smacking his lips and cowheel smacking them again and bacon smacking them once more and steak smacking them for the fourth time and peas cauliflowers new potatoes and sparrowgrass all working up together in one delicious gravy having come to the climax he smacked his lips a great many times and taking a long hearty sniff of the fragrance that was hovering about put on the cover again with the air of one whose toils on earth were over at what a time will it be ready asked mr codlin faintly it'll be done to a turn said the landlord looking up at the clock at twenty-two minutes before eleven then said mr codlin fetch me a pint of warm ale and don't let nobody bring into the room even so much as a biscuit till the time arrives and i do vow and protest that the above passage has caused much more smacking of lips than the most expensive savoury menu ever thought out true sparrow-grass and new potatoes and any peas but dried or tinned ones are not as a rule at their best in the same season as tripe 
but why not dried peas and old potatoes and rice and curry powder and onions charles dickens forgot the onions with maybe a modicum of old ale added for body in this stew on a cold day at sandown or kempton toujours iris stew like toujours mother-in-law is apt to pall upon the palate especially if not fresh made and frost occasionally interferes with the best laid plans of a race-course caterer i don't mind a postponed meeting once observed one of the readiest of bookmakers but what i cannot stand is postponed irish stew then a good bowl of scotch broth what could be more grateful or less expensive shin of beef pearl barley cabbages leeks turnips carrots dried peas of course soaked overnight and water all working up together in one delicious gravy also hotchpotch with the addition of cutlets from the best end of a neck of mutton the same recipe as the above will serve for this dish which it must be remembered should be more of a stodge than a broth there are more ways than one of making a hot pot the recipe given above would hardly suit the views of any caterer who wishes to make a living for himself but it can be done on the cheap the old lady whose dying husband was ordered by the doctor oysters and champagne procured whelks and ginger beef for the patient instead on the score of economy then why not make your hot pot with mussels instead of oysters or why add any sort of mollusk in the certain knowledge that these be invaluable hints to race-course caterers i offer them with all consideration and respect the writer well remembers the time when the refreshments on the new market heath at race time were dispensed from a booth which stood almost adjoining the bird cage said refreshments were rough but satisfying and consisted of thick sandwiches cheese and bread with thumb pieces or thumbers of beef mutton and pork which the luncher was privileged to cut with his own clasp knife said thumbers seem to have gone out of favour with the aristocracy of the turf but the true racing or coursing sandwich still forms part of the impedimenta of many a cash bookmaker of his clerk and of many a little backer tis a solid satisfying sandwich and is just the sort of nourishment for a hard worker on a bitter november day let your steak be grilling whilst you are enjoying your breakfast some prefer the ox portion fried for these simple speculators have strange tastes then take the steak off the fire and place it all hot between two thick slices of bread the sandwich will require several paper wrappings if you value the purity of your pocket linings and when eating cold the juices of the meat will be found to have irrigated the bread with more or less delicious gravy and as sam weller ought to have said it's the gravy as does it but what about the swells i fancy i hear somebody asking is my lord tomnady or the duke of earlswood to be compelled to satisfy his hunger on a race-course with tripe and fat bacon are you really advising those dapper-looking tailor-made ladies on yonder to drag to insert their delicate teeth in a sandwich which would have puzzled gargantua to masticate not at all my good sir or madam the well-appointed coat should be well appointed within and without of course the luncheon it contains will differ materially according to the season of the year this is the sort of meal i will provide and you will deign to visit the arabian tent behind my coach at ascot lobster mayonnaise salmon cutlets with tartar sauce iced curried prawns iced lobster cutlets chauffre of quails foie gras in aspic prawns in ditto plover's eggs gooseberry fool and as the piece de resistance an angel pie many people would call this a pigeon pie for in good sooth there be pigeons in it but tis a pie worthy of a brighter sphere than this six plump young pigeons trimmed of all superfluous matter including pinions and below the thighs season with pepper and salt and stuff these pigeons with foie gras and quartered truffles and fill up the pie with plover's eggs and some good force meat make a good gravy from the superfluous parts of the birds and some calf's head stock to which has been added about half a wine glass full of old madeira with some lemon juice and cayenne see that your paste be light and flaky and bake in a moderate oven for three hours pour in more gravy just before taking out and let the pie get cold 
this is a concoction which will make you back all the winners whilst no heiress who nibbles at it would refuse you her hand and heart afterwards this is another sort of pigeon pie which is best served hot and is more suited to the dining room than the race course line a pie dish with veal force meat very highly seasoned about an inch thick place on it some thin slices of fat bacon three bordeaux pigeons trimmed in halves a veal sweetbread in slices an ox palate boiled and cut up into dice a dozen asparagus tops a few button mushrooms the large ones would give the interior of the pie a bad colour and the yolks of four eggs cover with force meat and bake for three hours some good veal gravy should be served with this which i have named suffolk pride it is a remarkable fact in natural history that english pigeons are at their best just at the time when the young rooks leave the shelter of their nests therefore i have written in the above recipe bordeaux pigeons here is a quaint old eighteenth-century recipe which comes from northumberland and is given verbatim for a goose pie bone a goose a turkey a hare and a brace of grouse skin it and cut off all the outside pieces i mean of the tongue after boiling it lay the goose for the outside a few pieces of hair then lay in the turkey the grouse and the remainder of the tongue and hair season highly between each layer with pepper and salt mace and cayenne and put it together and draw it close with a needle and thread take twenty pounds of flour put five pounds of butter in a pan with some water let it boil pour it among the flour stir it with a knife then work it with your hands till quite stiff let it stand before the fire for half an hour then raise your pie and set it to cool then finish it put in the meat close the pie and set it in a cold place ornament according to your taste bandage it with calico dipped in fat let it stand all night before baking it will take a long time to bake the oven must be pretty hot for the first four hours and then allowed to slacken to know when it is enough raise one of the ornaments and with a fork try if the meat is tender if it is hard the pie must be put in again for two hours more after it comes out of the oven fill up with strong stock well seasoned or with clarified butter all standing pies made in this way verily in the eighteenth century they must have had considerably more surplus cash and time and rather more angelic cooks than their descendants during cold weather the interior of the coach should be well filled with earthenware vessels containing such provender as hot pot hare soup mulligatawny lobster a l'americaine curried rabbit deviled larks with the materiel for heating these such cold viands as game pie pressed beef boar's head foie gras truffled plain truffles to be steamed and served with buttered toast anchovies etc the larks should be smothered with a paste made from a mixture of mustard chili vinegar and a little anchovy paste and kept closely covered up after heating add cayenne to taste gourmets interested in menus may like to know what were the first dejeuner partaken of by the tsar on his arrival in paris in october eighteen sixty nine on the first day he had huitres consommé oeufs à la parisienne filet de boeuf pommes de terre nesseraux de sauce chocolat next day he ate huitres consommé oeuf dauphine rouget noisette d'anjou marical pommes de terre cal à la bohémienne poids bas le duc the writer can recall some colossal luncheons partaken of at dear naughty simla in the long ago when a hill station in india was if anything livelier than at the present day and furnished plenty of food for both mind and body our host was the genial proprietor of a weekly journal to which most of his guests contributed after their lights sport and the drama falling to the present writer's share most of the food at those luncheons had been specially imported from europe and although the white bait tasted more of the hermetical ceiling than of the thames mud most of the other items were succulent enough there were turtle soup and turtle fins highly seasoned pates of sorts and the native kansama had added several dishes of his own providing and invention a young florican bustard is by no means a bad bird well roasted and basted and though the eternal villa leaf veal olives were usually sent away untasted 
his snipe puddings were excellent what was called pachise twenty-five years old brandy from the atelier of Messrs. justerini and brooks was served after the coffee and those luncheon parties seldom broke up until it was time to dress for dinner in fact our memories were not often keen as to anything which occurred after the coffee and many strange things happened in consequence although as they have no particular connection with high-class cookery they need not be alluded to in this chapter but as observed before i am of opinion that luncheon except under certain circumstances is a mistake end of section five recording by corinne lepage section six of cakes and ale this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by annie rue cakes and ale by edward spencer chapter six dinner some have meat and canna eat and some would eat that want it but we can eat and we have meat and say the lord be thank it it is somewhat humiliating to reflect that we britons owe the art of dining to our first conquerors the romans a smooth-faced race of voluptuaries whose idea of a bon bouche took the form of a dormouse stewed in honey and sprinkled with poppy seed but it was not until the normans had fairly established themselves and their cookery that the sturdy saxon submitted himself to be educated by the foreign food spoiler and at a later period the frequent invasions of france by britain when money was tight in the little island were undoubtedly responsible for the commencement of the system of decorating food which so largely obtains to-day the name dinner is said although it seems incredible that the word should have become so corrupted to be a corruption of dix heures the time at which a m in the old norman days the meal was usually partaken of and the time at which p m in later years when none of the guests ever knew the hour in that loose and careless period the meal was occasionally partaken of at limner's and at lane's in london town froissart in one of his works mentions having waited upon the duke of lancaster at five p m after his grace had supped and it is certain that during the reigns of francis i and louis the twelfth of france the world of fashion was accustomed to dine long before the sun had arrived at the meridian and to sup at what we now call afternoon tea-time Louis the fourteenth did not dine till twelve, and his contemporaries, Oliver Cromwell and Mary Monarch, sat down to the principal meal at one. In seventeen hundred, two was the fashionable time, and in seventeen fifty one we read that the Duchess of Somerset's hour for dinner was three. The hour for putting the soup on the table kept advancing until, after Waterloo, it became almost a penal offence to dine before six and so to the end of the century when we sit down to a sumptuous repast at a time when farm laborers and artisans are either snug between blankets or engaged in their final wrangle at the blue pig the romans in the time of cicero had a light breakfast at three thirty a m lunched at noon and attacked the shena at periods varying between three and seven p m according to the season of the year they commenced the first course with eggs and each noble roman was supposed to clear his palate with an apple at the conclusion of the third course a banquet with vitilius we read was no light simple repast leagues of sea and miles of forest had been swept to furnish the mere groundwork of the entertainment hardy fishermen had spent their nights on the heaving wave that the giant turbo might flap its snowy flakes on the emperor's table broader than its broad dish of gold many a swelling hill clad in the dark oak coppice had echoed to the ringing shout of hunter and deep mouth bay of hound ere the wild boar yielded his grim life by the morass and the dark grisly carcass was drawn off to provide the standing dish that was only meant to gratify the eye even the peacock roasted in its feathers was too gross a dainty especially the feather part we should think for epicures who studied the art of gastronomy under caesar and that taste would have been considered rustic in the extreme which could partake of more than the mere fumes and savour of so substantial a dish 
a thousand nightingales had been trapped and killed indeed for this one supper but brains and tongues were all they contributed to the banquet while even the wing of a roasted hare would have been considered far too coarse and common a food for the imperial table talk about a bean fest according to suetonius whose name suggests duff the villa nero was accustomed to dine in a superb apartment surrounded with mechanical scenery which could be shifted with every course the suppers of vitellius the glutton cost on the average more than four thousand pounds apiece which reads like a kaffir circus dinner at the savoy and the celebrated feast to which he invited his brother was down in the bill for forty thousand three hundred and fifty pounds now a nights we don't spend as much on a dinner even when we invite other people's wives it consisted i always think of little dombey and the dinner at dr blimber's on reading these facts of two thousand different dishes of fish and seven thousand of fowls with other equally numerous meats sharp biting salads salted herrings and pickled anchovies were served as hors d'oeuvres during the first course of a roman banquet to stimulate the hunger which the rest of the meal would satisfy but although vitellius was according to history a whale on oysters they do not appear to have been eaten as a whet to appetite and it was the duty of one or more of the emperor's freedmen to taste every dish before his imperial master in case poison might lurk therein a garland of flowers around the brows was a regular wear for guests at a swagger dinner party in ancient rome and the eating part over said garland was usually tilted back on the head the while he who had dined disposed himself in an easy attitude on his ivory couch and proffered his cup to be filled by the solicitous slave then commenced the big drink but it must be remembered that although the subsequent display of fireworks was provided from the lively early christians in tar overcoats these romans drank the pure unadulterated juice of the grape freely mixed with water so that headaches in the morning were not de rigueur nor did the subsequent massacres and other diversions in the amphitheatre cause any feelings of jumpiness the roman bill of fare however does not commend itself to all british epicures one of whom wrote in a convivial song old lucellus they say forty cooks had each day and vitellius's meals cost a million but what i like is good when or where be my food in a chop-house or royal pavilion at all feasts if enough i must heartily stuff and a song at my heart alike rushes though i've not fed my lungs upon nightingales tongues nor the brains of goldfinches and thrushes my pen loves to linger long over the gastronomies of those shaven voluptuaries the ancient italians and my caledonian readers will forgive the old tales when it is further set forth that the romans introduced amongst other things haggis into bonnie scotland yes the poet's great chieftain of the puddin race is but an italian dish after all the apician pork haggis was a boiled pig stomach filled with fry and brains raw eggs and pineapples beaten into a pulp and seasoned with liquamen for although some of the roman tastes savoured of refinement many of them were absolutely beastly the idea of pig's fry and pineapples mixed is horrible enough but take a look into the constitution of this liquamen and wonder no longer that gibbons wrote his decline and fall with so much feeling and gusto this sauce was obtained from the intestines gills and blood of fishes great and small stirred together with salt and exposed in an open vat in the sun until the compound became putrid when putrefaction had done its work wine and spices were added to the hell broth which was subsequently strained and sent into the roman market this liquamen was manufactured in greece and not one of all the poets of sunny italy seems to have satirized the made in greece custom which in those days must have been as almost as obnoxious as the made in germany or the made in whitechapel scare of to-day the usual farinaceous ingredients of the roman haggis was frumenty but frequently no grain whatsoever was applied and instead of mincing the ingredients as do the scots the ancients pounded them in a mortar well moistened with liquamen until reduced to a pulp 
we are further told in history that a roman gladiator was capable after playing with eggs fish nightingale tongues dormice and haggis of finishing a wild boar at a sitting but as the old lady remarked of the great tragedy this happened a long time ago so let's hope it isn't true the saxon dining table was oblong and rounded at the ends the cloth was crimson with broad gilt edgings hanging low below the table and it is to be feared often soiled by the dirty boots of the guests who sat on chairs with covered backs and counterfeit presentments of which are still to be seen in the tottenham court road the food consists of fish fowls beef mutton venison and pork wild and domestic either boiled baked or broiled and handed to the company by attendants on small spleels a favorite fish joint of the old saxon was a cut out of the middle of a porpoise and bread of the finest wheaten flour reposed in two silver baskets at each end of the table above the salt the retainers having to contend themselves with coarser household out of a wooden cradle almost the only vegetable in use among the saxons was colwort although the romans had brought over many others years before but hatred of anything foreign was more rampant in the early saxon days than at present forks were not introduced into england until during the reign of king jamie so that our ancestors had perforce to thumb their victuals the fair queen elizabeth like much more modern monarchs was accustomed to raise her mouth with her virgin fingers a turkey leg and gnaw it but even the earliest days of the thirteenth century each person was provided with a small silver basin and two flowered napkins of the finest linen for finger washing and wiping purposes grapes figs nuts apples pears and almonds constituted a saxon dessert and in the reign of edward the third an act of parliament was passed forbidding any man or woman to be served with more than two courses unless on high days and holidays when each was entitled to three here is the bill for the ingredients of a big dinner provided by a city company in the fifteenth century two loins of veal and two loins of mutton one shilling four pence one loin of beef four pence one dozen pigeons and twelve rabbits nine pence one pig and one capon one shilling one goose and one hundred eggs one shilling half pence one leg of mutton two and a half pence two gallons of sack one shilling four pence eight gallons of strong ale one shilling six pence total seven shillings six pence alas in these advanced days the goose alone would have cost more than the damn total cedric the saxon's dining-table described in ivanhoe was of a much simpler description than the one noted above and the fare also but there was no lack of assorted liquors old wine and ale good meat and cider rich morat a mixture of honey and mulberry juice a somewhat gouty beverage probably and odoriferous pigment which was composed of highly spiced wine sweetened with honey the virgin queen at a later epoch was catered for more delicately and we read that she detested all coarse meats evil smells and strong wines during the georgian era coarse meats and strong wines were by no means out of favor and highland banquets especially were gargantuan feasts to be read of with awe the dinner given by fergus MacIver in honor of captain waverley consisted of dishes of fish and game carefully dressed at the upper end of the table immediately under the eye of the english stranger lower down stood immense clumsy joints of beef says the gifted author which but for the absence of pork abhorred in the highlands resembled the rude festivity of the banquet of penelope's suitors but the central dish was a yearling lamb called a hog in harst roasted whole it was set upon its legs with a bunch of parsley in its mouth and was probably exhibited in that form to gratify the pride of the cook who piqued himself more on the plenty than the elegance of his master's table the sides of this poor animal the lamb not the cook we suppose he meant were fiercely attacked by clansmen some with dirks others with knives worn in the same sheath as the dagger so that it was soon rendered mangled and a rueful spectacle the spectacle which reminds the writer of a dinner table at the royal military college sandhurst in the early sixties lower down continues sir walter the victuals seemed of yet coarser quality though sufficiently abundant 
broth onions cheese and the fragments of the feast regaled the sons of ivor who feasted in the open air the funeral baked meats used after the internment of the chief of the clan quahili described in the fair maid of perth were also on a very extensive scale and were like the other meal digested with pails full of uskaba for which no highland head that supported a bonnet was ever the wear in the morn and the custom of placing bagpipers behind the chairs of the guests after they have well drunk which is still observed in the highland regiments was probably introduced by the aforesaid fergus MacIver, who really ought to have known better and so the years roll on and at the commencement of the nineteenth century old england instead of enjoying the blessings of universal peace such as the spread of the gospel of christianity might have taught us to expect found herself involved in rather more warfare than was good for trade or anything else the first innings of the corsican usurper was but a short but merry one the second saw him finally stumped and from that period dates the avenging of waterloo which we have suffered in silence for so long the immigration of aliens commenced and in the tight little island were deposited a large assortment of the poisonous seeds of alien cookery which have never exactly flourished before the combat between the roast beef of old england and the bad fairy allah with her attendant sprites grease vinegar garlic commenced a combat which the end of the nineteenth century looked excessively like terminating in favor of the fairy it has been repeatedly urged against my former gastronomic writings that they are unjustly severe on the french cookery that far greater minds than mine have expressed unqualified approval thereof that i know absolutely nothing about the subject and that my avowed hatred of our lively neighbors and their works is so ferocious as to become ridiculous these statements are not altogether fair to myself i have no avowed hatred of our lively neighbors in fact on one occasion on returning from the celebration of the grand prix i saw a vision of but that is a different anecdote my lash has never embraced the entire battery de cuisine of the chef and there may be many french plats which are agreeable to the palate as long as we are satisfied that the material of which they are composed is sound wholesome and of the best quality it is the cheap restaurateur who should be improved out of england i was years ago inveigled to visit a kitchen of one of these grease and garlic shops and but the memory is too terrible for language and will anybody advance the statement that a basin of the tort claire of the average chef deserves to be mentioned in the same breath with a plate of clear turtle at birches or painters or that good genuine english soup whether oxtail mock turtle pea oyster or palestine is not to be preferred to the french puree or their tea kettle broth flavored with carrots cabbages and onions and dignified by the name consomme then let us tackle the subject of fish would you treat a salmon in the british way or smother him with thick brown gravy fried onions garlic mushrooms inferior claret oysters sugar pepper salt and nutmeg on matelote or mince him fine to make a ridiculous mousse similarly with honest manly soul would you fry or grill him plain or bake him in a coat of rich white sauce onion juice mussel ditto and white wine cider a la normande or cover him with toasted cheese a la carinale the fairly a la is likewise responsible for clothing of purely english food in french disguises thus a leg of mutton becomes a guijot a pheasant for its transgressions in eating the poor farmer's barley a faison and is charged for special rates and the bill whilst the nearest to a beefsteak our lively neighbors can get is a portion of beef with a fibre smashed by a wooden mallet surmounted by exceedingly bilious looking compound like axle grease and called chateau brillant and curry comes under the new regime carry undoubtedly the principal reason for serving food smothered in made gravies lies in the inferiority of the food few judges will credit france with the possession of better butcher's meat 
with the exception of veal than the perfidious island which is so near in the matter of distance and yet so far in the matter of custom and it is an established fact that the fish of paris is not as fresh as the fish of london hence sole normande the sole au gratin and the sole smothered in toasted cheese but when we islanders are charged at least four times as much for the inferior article in its foreign cloak as for the home article in its native majesty i think the time has come to protest it is possible to get an excellent dinner at any of the gordon hotels at the savoy the cecil and at some of the other noted food houses more especially at romano's by paying a stiff price for it but it is due to a shameful lack of enterprise on the part of the english caterers that a well-cooked english dinner is becoming more difficult to procure year after year there be three purely british dishes which are always hoff before all others on the programme of club hotel or eating-house and these are irish stew liver and bacon and tripe and onions yet hardly a week passes without a new diner parisienne making its appearance in the advertisement columns of the newspapers whilst the cheap and nasty table de haute with its six or seven courses and its spanish claret has simply throttled the roast beef of old england sir said dr johnson after examining a french menu my brain is obfuscated after the perusal of this heterogeneous conglomeration of bastard english ill-spelt and a foreign tongue i prithee bid thy knaves bring me a dish of hogs puddings a slice or two from the upper cut of a well-roasted sirloin and two apple dumplings william said george augustus sala to the old waiter at the cheshire cheese i've had nothing fit to eat for three months get me a point steak for god's sake the great lauder of foreign cookery had only that day returned from a special mission to france to write up the works of the cordon bleu for the benefit of us benighted englishmen no man in the wide world knew so much or could write so much on the subject of and in praise of the fairy allah as george sala and probably no man in the wide world so little appreciated her efforts but how has it come about that that fairy allah has gained such headway into this island of ours the answer must commence another chapter end of section six